Thanks, Tony. So Matthew Cox sends his apologies. Matthew's the director of Logan Together, and he's at the uh, Regional Early Years Conference in Rockhampton today, so he's stuck with me. And as Tony said, I'm a marketing comms engagement professional, so I'm not an educator, um, but I certainly love to talk, so I'm happy to talk to you today about Logan Together, which I'm, which I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so firstly, I can see from the show of hands just then that many of you are already familiar with the project, which is great news because I'm only going to give you a very brief intro. So what is Logan Together? It's a long-term campaign. We're going to be working on this project for the next 10 years. And as Tony said, what we aim to do um, in a nutshell is to close the gap in rates of health and child development in the city of Logan. So one of the headline indicators that we're looking at are the um, AEDC scores. And so we know that one in five children nationally arrive at primary school not, with the, not equipped socially and emotionally to learn. And then in Queensland, that number's one in four. And unfortunately in Logan at the moment, it's one in three. So there's about 40,000 children in Logan, age zero to eight. Um, most of them are doing fine. 10, 000, around 10,000 need some extra support, but we're actually interested in all 40,000 of them. So as Tony mentioned as well, we're using a collective impact framework. And so what that is essentially is a framework for organisations like us to work in a complex environment with lots and lots of stakeholders to achieve large scale social change. So the first, one of the most critical parts of that is to produce a common agenda. So we're talking about coordinating action across all three levels of government, business, the community services industry, um, civil society, faith-based groups, sporting clubs, and so forth. All of the, all of the important um, social and community networks that go into raising healthy children. So pretty important there that you have a common agenda, that everyone agrees on what the goal is, and that we're all work working towards a common vision. So how on earth do you go about producing a common agenda in such a complex environment? Well, we've, we've conducted very comprehensive research and Professor David Hogan is going to talk to that research in a few moments. But we've also just undertaken a three-month community-wide consultation. So we've conducted around 20 theme and population-based warm-up workshops, uh, two large plenary events which took place last month in September, and just last week we had our plenary event which brought together representatives of both the community services industry and the community, parents, carers, grandparents and so forth, all sitting around a table talking together about, about how to get the best opportunities for children in Logan. Uh, most importantly, we have done a child engagement project. So we've actually talked to kids and we've asked children aged four to nine years in some school-based workshops what they think is good about living in Logan at the moment, what's maybe not so good about living in Logan, and what their ideas and hopes and dreams are for themselves in the future. So we engaged Dr. Barbara Piscatelli, who's a, an early childhood expert, and she's a child's art curator. She's got, I think it's something like 5,000, Joe, is that right? 5,000 children's drawings and paintings um, in an archive. And we engaged her to design this, this project for us, because we've, we've had a little bit on over the three months, so we needed some help. <laughs> Um, so the aim is to capture the children's ideas, experiences and voices and contribute them to the foundation roadmap. So as I mentioned before, this is a 10-year campaign. When we talk about having a, um, a roadmap, this is, you know, what, what is our agreed objectives? What is it that we're all working on together? And so for year one, we're producing a foundation roadmap and over the next year, we'll then be refining that and developing it further for the, for the 10 years of the project. So the process involved, um, I was part of the project team and my colleague Jo, who's in the audience today, um, two hours with these groups of children. So we met with um, 69 children in total. The first hour was conversation around um, general, general wellbeing. And the second hour of each session involved the children actually drawing and painting and sharing their stories with us. Um, we had some arts workers and educators there to help facilitate that process. So altogether we met with 69 children aged between 4 and 9 years, 37 girls, 32 boys, and we went to Rosie's Early Learning Centre, Woodridge State School, years 1 and 3, and also Bean Lee State School, and met with children in year 2. And we were absolutely blown away <laughs> with the quality of information that the children came forth with, like little kids in prep. The, the, it, it was my boy. I'm going to share with you some of their drawings and stories. 
So part one, discussion. So you can see Barbara there is um, feeding the children's minds with, with general ideas about wellbeing so that we can start to then extract some of that rich information. So what's good about living in Logan? This is a word cloud. We've plugged in all of the data. Data. I keep saying data because Barbara's American and I've been hearing her say data for the last couple of months. Um, and so that obviously the largest words are the ones that came through most prominently. So the children were really focused on nature. Lots of talk about forest, looking after plants, taking care of animals, water and gardens. Um, and what's great about Logan is you can go everywhere. So there was a real focus on um, going somewhere, doing something, and who you're doing it with as well. Water, water parks kept coming up as well. <laughs> so what's bad about living in Logan? So house fires was actually the most prominent um, repeated theme, and it's been quite, quite prominent in the media of, of late in Logan. Swearing, break-ins, killing, jail, robberies, stealing is bad, weapons are bad. Um, from kids of four, just incredible. So part two after the talk fest, we got into the fun stuff. We got into the drawing and painting. So small workshops, and the children were asked to fill the page. So first of all, to draw with a thick black marker, and then to fill in their drawings with beautiful um, colouring in with watercolour pencils, and then, then applied water to turn into a watercolour painting. And they also, while they were working on their drawings, told their stories to one of the arts workers or educators, and we recorded those stories for them in the child's own words. So what were the key themes that came out? Well, for children four to nine in Logan, home and family are absolutely central. So 25 girls and 19 boys chose to depict those themes in their artworks. As I said earlier, it was all about where they're going, what they're doing, and who it's with. Unfortunately, this image isn't coming through, but um, you can see for this little girl, it's all about just the simple things, but who she's sharing that with. She's on the sofa with mum, dad, nana and papa. Her brother's asleep, but her and mum are staying up watching a movie and eating popcorn. <clears throat> this child chose to draw his family, sorry, her, her family coming home, and home makes her happy because she gets to spend more time with family. Boys were certainly more concerned with safety and security, uh, with 11 boys and, th and three girls drawing and writing about safety, police, surveillance, alarm systems, and robberies. A couple of them wanted to be police officers when they grow up, which I thought was excellent. This little girl drew her future life. She chose to tell a story about herself as a grown up. Um, so she was inside the house and about to go to work, but forgot it was her turn to look after the twins, but she didn't, want it, she didn't want anyone to get hurt, so they stayed home instead of going to the park or beach. So real concern around security there in the community. So children said they learn in many, many places, including the home, school, the community and church, but only three actually drew about learning. <coughs> So here we can see the prominence of caring for nature and um, pets and plants with 15 girls and 21 boys choosing to focus on that strategy. So we were blown away in one of the early sessions in um, Woodridge School, just the amount of times that children talked about when we asked what's bad about Logan, the, the response is like, well sometimes people step on the plants and they die. Or, <laughs> or people forget to water the flowers and they die. So you could tell that it was really, really the importance of looking after nature and being responsible. Um, was, was really drilled into these kids, which is fantastic. Um, the children were very articulate in discussing um, their need for a clean and safe environment and their own role and the responsibility that they take in providing that environment and keeping it clean. This is the final image that for some reason hasn't loaded up. I, I do apologise, but uh, this child um, drew himself watering the garden where he would live with his big brothers. So again, about what he's doing and who he's doing it with. Um, and many children portrayed, portrayed their future lives <coughs> with 11 boys and three girls choosing that strategy. Uh, future life options included working as a scientist, a miner, policeman or woman, a nurse, vet, um, participating in sporting clubs, uh, a church, as well as having large homes, caring for pets, and living in the same communities. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> this was really fun, this project. <laughs> Um, and a couple of the children were really big picture thinkers. So we had a little girl from Rosie's, for a, a prep age child, 
for a water treatment plant. <laughs> So the water treatment plant cleans the water so that we don't swallow the yucky water. The sun is shining brightly on the water treatment plant. And this next one, I probably shouldn't say it's my favourite, but it's my favourite. So this little kid took a global perspective, which we just thought was very, very, very impressive. This little boy was from Woodridge State School from year one. So the recommendations that came out of this particular piece, so we've engaged with um, probably over a thousand people. So the, the various sort of chapters and, and groups that we've spoken with so far included the child and family, civil society, disability, domestic and family violence, drug and alcohol, education, employment, training, ethnic leaders, health, housing and homelessness, mental health, migrant families, young mums from the Maple Park Power Program, and more. So we've, we've done a lot, of, a lot of talking to a lot of people over the last three months. And so the next stage for us is that we are currently um, compiling all of that data into the roadmap, which we'll be sharing, what month are we, October, we'll be sharing that next month, the first draft, and there'll be a period of about two weeks where we'll be taking feedback. Um, and then that document is going to be published a bit later this year. So the recommendations from, from this particular piece of work with the children included um, keeping family and home as central to any initiative, any new projects that are a result of working together. And that we have we place real value on on play. Children pl place an enormous value on play. Keep children's involvement and participation in the program. So about building long-term relationships with the children we've spoken to so far um, at those particular schools, but also about partnering strategically with different schools so that we can include the voices of even more children as we move forward. Um, and make sure that the voices are always prominent in, in any of our discussion about, about what to do with Logan together. So I've got a, a really quick video that I'd love to show you that shows the process that we undertook. And then I'm going to hand over to David Hogan to take you through some of our data. Project to gather children's ideas for their child engagement strategy for their new project. So we've come to schools in the Logan region, schools and child care centers, to talk to children from four to eight years old about what they think about living in Logan now, what's good, what's bad, and what could be better. And we're also talking to them about well-being, uh, looking at the RACI indicators and looking at how well-being plays out for a child who's between four and eight years old. Those are the target children for this new initiative in Logan, and we think that the information that we gather now about how children see their world will help us to plan for the future, uh, for a better future for these children. When they're um, between 14 and 18 years old, the Logan Together project will finish and we'll be able to show whether or not there's been any change in their lives by looking back at their drawings, their paintings, and their stories. The ultimate outcome will be that the children of Logan will be represented in building the roadmap for Logan Together and building the roadmap for their own future. And so I'm really thrilled to be able to work with a confident staff team and members of Logan Together to, to gather these ideas and to treat them as serious ideas that will help build a future. Volumes 1 and 2 in three months, so uh, he doesn't sleep much. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to give a very brief overview of some of the data work that Logan Together uh, has embarked on doing. Uh, the, the core, one of the core challenges of Logan Together is to figure out how to design government programs and the provision of services at the local level in an integrated way that responds to the specific issues that characterise particular populations of particular communities. And my task when I was hired by Matthew uh, just three months ago was to figure out you know, where these populations were, where did they live, and what were the issues that were confronting them? And what was the relationship between these different issues, the different challenges that the families and communities had? So over the last three months, I've, I've, I've attempted to pull together existing data sets from uh, the Departments of Education, uh, Health, uh, Justice, uh, and so on, in attempt, and Department of Communities, in an attempt to figure out and, make, and develop a coherent picture, a comprehensive coherent picture of at riskness. Who is at risk in, Singapore, in, uh, in uh, Logan and where do they live? So in attempting to do this, I've asked uh, these seven questions. Now, I can't answer these questions today, but I will answer just a couple of them very quickly with some uh, indicative data. Now, this is the data that we, uh, this is a schema of the data that we're trying to collect. Now, you can see that we've focused on four age periods, uh, perinatal, uh, age 4 to 5, age 5, and age 8. Now there's some big gaps here. Not being able to collect data, for example, for children uh, between infancy and 4. There's a real dearth of, of useful public information about the lives of children in that age group. Now uh, we are making efforts to fill that gap uh, in various ways, but so far we've not been able to locate data that will allow us to say anything meaningful about lives of children in that age group. So for perinatal, we've looked at the risk factors uh, that uh, affect children's health status at birth, and those include uh, whether mother smokes, teen motherhood, antenatal visits, overweight and obese mothers. Uh, we looked at various indicators of the health status risk factors of children, uh, of babies, whether they're premature, whether they're low birth weight, whether their APGAR scores were high or low, and then whether they were related to uh, high uh, care units within hospitals. For ages four and five, uh, we're looking at particular measures of uh, parent behavior, that might support or inhibit child learning. And those include the ones that I listed there. Preschool attendance, parent support for reading and learning. That's a AEDC uh, in, uh, index measure that is reported by the AEDC. Internet connections, primary school attendance, and family violence. And family violence is measured both by domestic violence, that is domestic violence among intimate partners, or child abuse uh, that uh, is visited upon children in the household. For age fives, we've looked primarily at the AEDC data, which has five domains, uh, physical well-being, social competence, uh, emotional well-being, uh, language and cognitive skills, uh, communication, and general knowledge, and whether children are vulnerable on more than one of these domains or on two or more domains. Now, many of you will be familiar with the AEDC data, which is, is broadly published and reported and discussed, but I'm going to actually show you just a couple of slides that will give you an idea of where things stand in uh, Logan. And then finally, uh, for NAPLAN, uh, we've looked at both the general <coughs> national standard and the, the percentage of the cohort in each school that attains to the top two bands of the NAPLAN results. I've also looked at the results for uh, the Year 5 NAPLAN. I won't report those today. Actually, I will. I'll, I'll mention those briefly. So that's the data that we've looked at. And then we've also looked at family background and community context. Where do they live? 
Uh, the demographic profile of the family, family composition, who composes the family, family functioning, particularly around family violence matters, family economy, the education, employment, income and housing situation of the family, uh, CFIL, which is an index of disadvantage developed by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, crime and violence theory. So for all of these indicators at the top, these outcome measures, we've actually created a profile, a socioeconomic profile of families, and all of this data is then reported at what's called the SA2 level, which is a statistical reporting unit developed by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which covers at about 10,000 households. Now this is an important reservation. We're not reporting individual level data. We don't actually have access, no one has access to that data across this range of indicators. So we're reporting this at, the, at an area level, which means that you've got to be very careful about the inferences you draw uh, from that ecological data. You can't infer that because a particular suburb in Logan scores are quite highly on a risk factor, then it means that everybody in that neighbourhood of that, of that suburb is going to be scoring highly as well. So there's a big gap between the ecological measure and the individual. So, uh, the first question we've asked is, and this is in many ways is the key generic question, who is at risk in what suburbs on what issues? That's the key issue we want to answer. Now, this just shows you how we've gone about answering this. So this is looking at the Development of Vulnerability Index from AEDC. Many of you will be familiar with this. And what we've done is you can actually, I've just listed the top uh, at-risk suburbs in Logan together. You can see, and this is calculated by taking the percentage of children who are vulnerable, not, which, is, which is a step beyond being at risk. It's children who are immediately vulnerable to serious harm. And so what we've done, we've taken the averages, uh, percentages of children in each suburb, and then we've averaged those average to get an average score, and then we've ranked all of them. So you can see that Logan Central, followed by Kingston, uh, score have the highest percentage of children. The highest percentage of children, not necessarily the raw numbers, with the highest percentage of children that are at risk. And so on down to the, there are about, I think, close to 31 or 32 SA2s in the Logan area that we can report. I'm not going to show the others, but this simply indicates how we've approached this. Another indicator we've used uh, is the BAPLAN results. This is for the minimum national standard. All of you will be familiar with this. Uh, again, we have followed the same procedure. We calculate now. This has been um, for this one. What we have done is aggregated at the uh, SA2 level. So this is not by school, but by SA2. So we can compare it to other SA2s. And what you can see again that the uh, the suburb Riba that has the highest average, the lowest average of reaching the minimal national standard uh, is Berimba, followed by Kingston, Marsden, and so on. And then all the way down to the 32, 33 SA2s. Now what we do eventually, this is another wrinkle on the NAPLAN scores, and I, I showed this to Sharon and her staff last week. Uh, what I've actually done here is compared the year three, the, the NAPLAN year three and the NAPLAN year five results. And I've compared uh, uh, for each school, not, not SA2, but for each school, what percentage of the students attain minimal national standard or attain to the top two bands. And you can see between year three and year five, percentage of students attaining that threshold drops off. Now this is not longitudinal data, we're not actually tracking particular kids over time, so that we're looking at them at year three and then at year five. We are just looking at cross-sectional data. Now this is really an important finding because it indicates that the school effect is negative. 
something very dramatic happening here. It means that the percentage of children who are attaining either the minimal national standard or reaching the top two bands is dropping off. And for the Logan together as a whole, sorry, the Logan area as a whole, the percentage drops off 6.26 for minimal national standard and 10.96 for uh, 11 percent for the top two banks. Now, some of these some of these percentages are small, some of them are high, but there's enormous variation. And one of the challenges I think to the to the district is going to be to figure out why is there so much variation here? Because there's not there's, the, the, the variation in demographic profile is not as great as the variation as in these numbers. So there's something really, really important going on there. Um, okay, just quickly. So question four, when we look at all the data that we have, that we've been able to put together, what do we find? Well, you can see I've ranked ordered, uh, for each of the outcome indicators, I've ranked ordered uh, what, where the suburb stands. And then I've averaged the rank order. So, uh, it's rank order in the rank order data. And what we find that the suburb across <laughs> those indicators, uh, there are one, two, three, I think eight or nine uh, across those indicators, looking at them are first of all Kingston, followed by Woodridge and Waterford West. <coughs> what this is telling us is that these are the suburbs that have the highest population of, populate, of children or parents at risk. Not necessarily the greatest number. I have another table which I won't show you today, which actually calculates the number of people that are the number of subjects that will be captured or debated by, say, a top ten strategy. But that's a, another matter. So we're talking not about raw numbers, but about percentages. And you, you can see here that the uh, the rank ordering suggests for this particular configuration for seven indicators what suburbs are most at risk. Now if we add, if we take away some of these indicators or add other indicators, the profile, the, the rank ordering will change. So this is, this rank ordering is dependent on what particular measures you use. So you can't jump to the conclusion that this is kind of set in positive. It will depend very much on the data you have available. And the data we have available is essentially opportunistic. It's data that I've been able to collect. So it's not a comprehensive picture. It simply reflects the data we've been able to capture so far. OK. Um, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of general questions about what have we found out? What does this data tell us about disadvantage in the urban area? We figured out, first of all, disadvantage is multi-generational. It's multi-dimensional. It's interdependent. It's institutionally embedded. It is multifactorial. It's geographically concentrated, and it is generative, cumulative, and persistent. I want to emphasize, given what Katie had to say in the, early, the first session, just how important that early childhood experiences are of child abuse and domestic violence. The data that we have here shows that there are very, and I don't, I'm not showing this data now, but the correlations at the area level between child abuse and all these other indicators are exceptionally high. And they're higher for child abuse than they are for domestic violence. So it's actually what happens to kids turns out, looks like it's more important than what's going on between the parents. But, but the correlations are exceptionally high. Now I'm talking about 0.7, 0.8 in some cases. So this is extraordinary and very, very high uh, correlations. So this indicates that kids who are handicapped by child abuse at an early age continue to be handicapped at each of these successive thresholds that they go through. So that's a, a, a huge challenge for policymakers going forward. OK, that's just a model of how these things fit together. Um, the logic of disadvantage showing, and showing over time how these might play out and how they might influence each other 
we've got the perinatal risk factors, the perinatal health status. Uh, then we've got in the middle here are the kind of issues that um, the risk factors associated with parent behavior. Uh, and and some, of, some of these are protective factors as well. And then uh, the, uh, the development of vulnerabilities, the transition to school, student engagement, attachment, uh, and then the year three, year five NAP and results. That's the logic of the pathways that link these indicators together. Now that can inform then the kind of strategy for interventions that we uh, adopt. And so what I've recommended to the Logan Together uh, project team is that the ones in red seem to me are the interventions that are most urgent. They're the ones that are indicated by the data. That they're the ones that we need to focus on. And you'll notice that one of them is school and classroom practices. Now, what's interesting about that is that we almost know nothing about what goes on in classrooms in Logan on a consistent basis. We know a lot about, as the style shows, we know something about the inputs, about the family characteristics, who comes from what family and so on. We know something about the student outcomes, for example, the ADC measures or the NAPAN results, but we know very little about what goes on in the middle. Now we have lots of anecdotal data, and principals know a lot about what goes on in their schools, in their classrooms. But we don't know about it systematically, to hear it comprehensively across the system. And one of the things that Sharon and I have been talking about is designing and developing a research program that's going to answer that question, what's in that black box? So we've got to throw some light on that black box. And that will be a part of the Logan together. Um, now, this is a model of what goes on in the black box that I use for the work I did in Singapore, uh, looking at these aspects of the internal life of the classrooms. And you can see that it's extraordinarily complex. And figuring out the relationships between these measures is not, it's not easy. But if we're going to capture what goes on in the classroom, we need to attend to this minimal set of indicators of the life of the classroom. And that, I'll thank you very much.